All right, everybody, let's uh, take our seats, get ready. So our next, um, it's a panel, which is awesome, is 5G Edge Compute, Essential Infrastructure to Scale AR and VR. Uh, this is an exciting talk, something that we really need to um, just jam on more as this industry starts to grow. Um, I'm excited to present Louisa Spring. Uh, Louisa has probably one of the craziest resumes I've seen, a lifetime of experience, which is so cool. So lawyer, producer, entrepreneur, um, the founder of Sam, um, sorry, Sam Im Immersive, I can say it, Sam Immersive, there it is. Um, Award-winning VR campaigns for Mini Cooper, um, just uh, moving the needle in the VR industry um, and working with some amazing companies like Walmart. So super excited, uh, Louisa, please, please run the show. I'm really excited to be presenting this panel today. We've got an amazing, you know, pan set of three panelists, four panelists. Luis, where are you? Oh, <laughs> it's day three of AWE. We've all survived, partied like rock stars, right? So, I mean, this is very good that we're still alive. Um, Luis, I'll wait for you. In the meantime, I know we have Greg Jones from NVIDIA who should be dialing in. So kind of like the Wizard of Oz, hopefully he's going to appear. <laughs> Maybe not. Oh, there he is. Greg, welcome. Can you hear us? Hi, Greg. So He's not hearing us yet. Okay. These things jingle. Yeah. I can. I can. Uh, uh, uh. Hey, great to have you here, Greg. So. Can you hear me? Yes, we yeah. can hear you. Fantastic. So I would like you to actually do an introduction of yourself and also what NVIDIA is up to in uh, edge compute and cloud. Can't hear me? Yeah. Whoa. Oh. Um. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. All right. Well, why don't, why don't we, we go, go back, back to Greg, to Greg in a, in a little, little bit more? more? Yeah. yeah. Can you, Can hear, you me hear me now, now Greg? Greg? I can't say that at an that next conference, conference right? right? <laughs> <laughs> I can. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Can, can hear, you. hear you. That's awesome. Fantastic. Fantastic. Okay. okay. So, so, Greg, Greg would, you would you like to like introduce yourself, yourself and also talk, talk a little, little bit about, about what NVIDIA, NVIDIA is doing regarding, regarding uh, NVIDIA, NVIDIA Cloud, Cloud etc.? Sure. I'm, I'm Greg Jones. I'm part of the XR team here at NVIDIA, and I am part of the product management team. And really quickly, uh, you can jump in. I'm going to talk about streaming XR with Cloud XR and the way we view uh, streaming XR. So, next slide, please. So, so at NVIDIA, when we think of XR, especially my group, we're, we're focused on enterprise. And this is a, a picture from Autodesk uh, VRED. And you can see when we think of VR, we think of photorealism. And, and enterprise is really a place where photoreal VR is and AR is, is the coin of the realm. So next, uh, next slide, please. So when we think of streaming and of course, real the VR idea of streaming AR, XR, XR the, the vision we, we have really are talking about XR, RTX servers is taking your XR NVIDIA content, GPUs, the like large the model, the high fidelity graphics, the, uh, you know, the consumer and getting those right the onto a large graphics card and, and then such. moving that information and then streaming that content over the, over the network to, to these, these all-in-one devices. Thinner clients and, and those so thin clients are obvious vision. It comes with its complexities. The XR market. This is uh, an example of a streaming AR. This is an alpha channel being taken out of Autodesk VRED. This is a McLaren 30 million polygon model of uh, the McLaren Senna. It's being rendered in a downtown LA data center, streamed to the LA Convention Center, 
over a production 5G network that's being rendered on an S10 uh, cell phone. And as we zoom into this steering wheel, you can see the resolution of the steering wheel is quite high, right? So this is the full model, no decimation. It's being rendered on actually two RTX 6000 cards. This was a couple of years ago. But really when we talk about AR streaming, we're talking about full graphics, full lighting, full model, everything like that, just to give you an idea of the image. So next slide, please. What, what's great? Yeah, you'll have to click this one more time just to get out of this slide. What's really phenomenal about this new era of streaming over 5G networks, networks use the cloud. is you know, once we get in the cloud, edge cloud, and just remote, and we now have distribution of AR content, APAC. XR content it, it all around really the world. So our consumer base for really high fidelity, network, rich photo reel, VR is changing from the need of a user to have a desktop to anyone that has a $300 plus headset is now a the, full the fidelity engineers VR the user time, or XR user. So this is a really exciting a really transition and, and we think and streaming is at really the heart of it and streaming over the key value adds in VR really and that's collaboration. Significantly. So the and that's, that's my environments that are coming up and what we're doing today. Really amazing. They're going to change the distribution of XR. Thanks so much. Thank you. And gonna so so next, next up we have Zon Mohan, Mohan, who is a developer advocate at Mobile EdgeX, and I believe we have a slide for the song. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, thanks, Lisa, for the introduction. Uh, I am a, on the product management team at Mobile EdgeX, and we'll see if the, the slide, we're able to pull that up. It's right there, so. We yeah. can see it. We can see it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, while we're it bringing will that take up, a little right? bit of a minute, I think. So. Yeah, well, while we're bringing that up, uh, Mobile EdgeX is a platform uh, that is working to bridge the gap between telco operators that are building out the latest and greatest with uh, their cellular networks and 5G and edge computing and bridging that with developers and application developers who are building the solutions, some of which we have here on the panel today, and making sure that we can connect those so that we can deliver some of the most innovative solutions that are out there that can take advantage of the higher bandwidth, the lower latency of that platform. And by homogenizing that across one platform that is exposed to various different operators, so we, we work with operators around the world and Europe and Asia, and that enables you to really quickly and easily with one click deploy those solutions, whether that be in Germany with Deutsche Telekom, which we'll talk a little bit about, as well as Japan KDDI. Um, this is just kind of that, that high level summary of what we're trying to do, which is connect those devices and applications to the telcos and, and uh, infrastructure uh, that is getting distributed today around the world. A um, couple operator partners that we work with up on the, on the slide here, and, and we'll talk a little bit more as we go throughout this panel about one of the case studies that we did uh, recently with Deutsche Telekom and KDDI, as well as Mawari and Sturfy, which are here on the panel today. Fantastic. So next up, we have Harini Sridharan, who is the co-founder and CTO of Sturfy. Oh, thank you, Luisa. Good morning, everybody. Um, I am from Sturfy. We are a computer vision-based startup. Uh, we work towards building the largest uh, connected digital twin representation of cities. Our patented visual positioning service um, enables user to not only experience 3D content in the digital world. Oh, apparently there was a video which is not playing. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, oh yeah, there it is. Okay, yeah. This is our digital twin representation of the cities. Uh, what makes us unique is our patented visual positioning service that enables users to experience this 3D content not only in the digital space, but also in the exact same physical representation in the real world. So we are a key platform to the new uh, city level metaverse, which uh, uh, enables uh, the social interactions and experiences to seamlessly transcend between the digital and the physical world. So we uh, have a unique uh, satellite-derived database pipeline that makes us highly scalable. We are the largest uh, uh, enabled VPS solution across Japan and uh, South Korea. We work closely with KDDI and uh, 
I'm also very excited to talk about our use case with uh, Mavari and Mobile HX and the use case of 5G. Fantastic. So next up, we have Luis Ramirez, who is CEO of Mawari. Thank you, Luisa. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Luis, founder and CEO of Mawari. We provide a 3D XR uh, streaming uh, platform and solution you can see here in the video. Uh, our mission is to remove the barrier of entry to, for developers and for everyone to actually access ed edge computing and, and streaming. So you can see right there is uh, this car is flying like just like back to the future uh, streaming from the, from the cloud. And it's also a super high polygon model with re reflections and all the bells and whistles. And on the left side, we have a, a meta human also being streamed in real time and giving you guidance uh, about the city. So I'll talk more about our, our uh, vision and unique approach. So and also a little bit about the case study that we did with uh, Mobile Ajax and, and Starfy. Thank you. Fantastic. The car looked amazing, by the way. If you can get me one in real life, I'm up for it. Okay. <laughs> um, next up, we have Yasmin Karimli. She's the Senior Director of Device Technology and Operations at T-Mobile. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Hi, everybody. Happy to be here. Hi, everyone on the other side of the camera. We have the video play. Oh, we have a p video. Awesome. Does it have sound? Putting on T-Mobile 5G to perform cell site maintenance. We're also testing a mixed reality 5G baseball experience at T-Mobile Park. We're building the biggest and best 5G network in the country. Let's collaborate to develop innovative products and solutions. All right, that was my presentation. Any questions? No, <laughs> no, 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 you're not getting off that easy. <laughs> We're going to talk about how the network is going to contribute to innovation in the space. So that kind of brings us very nicely, actually, to the introduction to 5G and Edge. Obviously, this crowd is pretty sophisticated. Yeah. But I thought it would be good if we talked through what T-Mobile was doing, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. And I believe we have some slides. Mm -hmm. Well, I can get started. Um, Here we go. Very well. Perfect. So 5G opens up endless possibilities for innovation in the space and connecting us to the world around us, um, as well as um, learning and contributing to our world. Uh, that's how we built the, the world's or the US uh, biggest 5G network so that we can all innovate on it. We can learn together, we can explore together, we could um, bring in a community of developers and innovators uh, to build a very vibrant 5G ecosystem. And um, we, uh, the, the network is the first thing we can bring to the table, right? It brings breadth, it brings depth, it brings capacity and reliability for applications that use um, a wide range of, of applications in, in the car or in the home. Um, and um, so we've built uh, a network uh, right after our merger with Sprint. We came uh, with incredible assets to, to the table. We are, we've built the biggest 5G network that covers almost all Americans. We used our low band spectrum to do that as well as uh, we added on top uh, mid-band spectrum for ultra capacity. This provides a, a huge platform for innovation in the XR space. We have the capacity and breadth um, to use the high band with low latency requirements for applications. Um, we are, we're not stopping there. Uh, we have a few initiatives. Next slide, please. We have a few initiatives um, at T-Mobile to fuel innovation. We were bringing in a community of developers and innovators that, that are bigger than ourselves to help fuel innovation. We've demonstrated uh, edge computing uh, capabilities, AI, and much, much more through this development uh, of uh, communication, community of uh, developers and innovators. Um, we've, uh, we have uh, worked with um, our open, 
5G Open Innovation Labs, uh, which, is a co which was co-founded with Microsoft, Intel, NASA, and others, um, has shown incredible development and innovation. As well as we have an accelerator program at T-Mobile that brings in um, young and startup companies. We've worked with 75 of them or, and more uh, growing in that space. You saw um, the uh, the announcement that Qualcomm had this week on Snapdragon Spaces, uh, starting in the spring, they're coming through our ac accelerator program as well to, uh, to, to work with startups, and I look forward to working with engineers and business leaders uh, to uh, fuel that innovation in the XR space. Um, so the next slide, please. Um, a little bit about our network. We have uh, a dedicated 5G standalone core that allows uh, use cases to be differentiated, as well as there's advanced radio features that are coming on, on the radio network that will allow us to, to do end-to-end -end optimization of services for performance. And uh, we're working with, per, my, my team, the device technology team, is working with chipset vendors, OEMs, and, and others to build products and services that work reliably and, the, and in the best performance possible on our network. Some of the tools in our toolbox could be network slicing, we can do private networks, uh, we could do mobile edge computing, uh, we have a, a distributed network of data centers ourselves and we've partnered with um, folks who have uh, fiber and enterprises and we're working with enterprise leaders, uh, some of the uh, top in the Fortune 50 uh, companies we're working with for use cases and being able to demonstrate and fuel uh, innovation in terms of AI, edge computing, XR, and, and other applications. So very exciting space. You'll see huge growth uh, in the next 18 to 24 months in this space. I personally am working on developing a standalone, not necessarily tethered um, AR solution with glasses and, and other things. So um, huge space, let's all collaborate to, to make it happen. Fantastic. Um, yeah. So we talked about a case study with KDDI and DT. Um, perhaps you could actually run that video. You know, I think it's very interesting, you know, what you've done here, uh, Sturfy and Mawari and Mobile Edge X with DT and KDDI on a kind of international level. So perhaps we can actually run the video. Der Veranstaltungsraum mit einer Kapazität von 1500 Besuchern wird gerne für öffentliche Veranstaltungen wie Konzerte verwendet. Mit ungefähr 5000 Mitarbeitern arbeiten wir hier an den Telekommunikationsinnovationen von morgen. This trial tested the ability to run advanced edge enabled services across different geographies and operator networks. Using the Mobileage X Edge cloud platform to provide unified access to KDDI's and Deutsche Telekom's 5G Edge Mech resources, Starfy and Mawari were able to easily deploy their services and run them with optimal latency and bandwidth to create an outstanding user experience. Leveraging Mawari's XR streaming solution, we were able to deliver a multiplayer real-time experience featuring hyper-realistic personalized digital assistance and sci-fi billboard advertisements perfectly placed into the real world outside in the streets, thanks to Starfy's visual positioning system. All working in perfect synchrony and speed, thanks to Mac and 5G. Let's dive into the advantages of edge computing with an 8B comparison. 
The digital human on the left is rendered by a smartphone and the one on the right is rendered by a mech server. The difference in quality is evident. The mech server digital human comprises hyper-detailed face animations, high-quality textures and high polygon count, ultra-realistic hair and clothing simulations, complicated lighting scenarios with dynamic materials and reflections, this can't be accomplished with a smartphone GPU today. In addition, to render the digital human on the left, more than one gigabyte of data needs to be downloaded, forcing users to wait and providing a bad user experience. In contrast, the one on the right can be streamed instantaneously. We will continue to work with interested operators and developers to build a global platform to make access to mech infrastructure as easy as possible. We expect to realize a whole new platform distributing innovative XR services and experiences across the world. We will keep leading to provide customers with advanced mech toward the 5G standalone era. Come and join us on this path. Could you put the audio down for a minute? Thanks, guys. So I think the, the, this video here kind of highlights all of the key areas that we're working on. And, and as we kind of have everyone here from the panel uh, that has contributed different services uh, that are all kind of put together as an end-to-end -end stack, that is ultimately what you end up seeing here. Without visual positioning from Sturfy, without the remote rendering capabilities from Mawari, without uh, NVIDIA and their GPUs and, and T-Mobile and other operators around the world, none of this actually becomes possible today. And, and I think that the really exciting part is this is very real, right? Like this is deployed, this is a solution that, that anyone can try out and it's all homogenized over the Mobile Edge X platform. And so through that, we make it very easy for, for developers to, to start integrating and putting those stacks together. And we're, we're really acting as that, that core enablement uh, to, to, to start getting these real world solutions actually deployed and start helping enterprises today. So with that, I think maybe we can we can transition a little bit to talking about individual pieces of the stack here. Sure, I will just uh, explain also a little bit. Uh, this is part of uh, in, in Japan. Unfortunately, it just is rolled out in Japan. It's part of an open API uh, by KDDI. And what does this mean? That all the services, mobile Ajax, Starfy, Ma Ma and Maware streaming are packaged into one simple solution that um, all developers can try out and can really see the difference of edge computing. So if anyone lives in Japan, uh, I mean, you can sign up for free. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I will happily onboard you, and you, you will have a, a six-month trial to, to, to get cloud streaming and Starfy services. I just Plus had a quick deal. question about the Unreal Engine MetaHumans as well. Sure. And that the ability to stream them over 5G with them looking a lot more realistic than they do. If you can just talk to a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, yeah, the, the MetaHumans, uh, basically, yeah, there's uh, like about one million polygons, but they, they are super complicated uh, in terms of uh, clothing simulation, hair simulation. Uh, they use probably about eight gigabits of uh, GPU RAM and they're, they're being rendered in real time. The highlight of uh, this uh, um, pilot project is that actually we provided a, a multiplayer experience, as it says. So actually, uh, all the users were seeing this, the same digital human synchronized and, and rendered from, from the edge. So that's actually quite a big achievement. And the second, second one is that actually, since you see the car and the other things, we were able to get many streams into one uh, single application. And the third is that uh, the point of this POC was to orchestrate uh, across the world, across uh, telcos, because they have different tech stacks. And thanks to Mobile AJAX, we were able to pack everything just in one application. So if you're in Germany, uh, you open up the application and the German uh, MetaHuman will explain about Germany. But if you're in Japan, the Japanese MetaHuman will explain about uh, Shibuya. So I need a digital assistant too, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Especially right now. So I wonder if we can get Greg back onto the screen. Um, as Vasant uh, indicated, I think we're going to talk about how each company fits into the stack. So perhaps we could start with you, Harini. Sure. 
So as uh, uh, Lewis was mentioning, the multiplayer experience, when you open it in Bonn, uh, the uh, the, the machine should intelligently know where the user is standing, what direction they are looking at, uh, what they are facing. So that kind of visual positioning service was provided by uh, Sterfi. And as I mentioned during my introduction, uh, we do have the largest deployment of such service across Japan. And we did parts of Japan very quickly for this use case. Uh, the key AI component of the positioning service was actually put on uh, the edge computing. So that made uh, a lot of the positioning more accurate because the 5G, thanks to 5G, we were able to stream a lot more frames than what is typically possible with 4G. So that helped us uh, to offload a lot of the computation onto the edge and with uh, much lower latency. And then a critical part of our service is actually providing a 3D mesh that is used for the occlusion in the video. Actually, you can see a billboard that is actually sticking to the right building, like the uh, Shibuya Tower. So that uh, kind of 3D mesh is also typically streamed from a cloud service. But in this case, we were able to serve it from the edge, again, uh, reducing the latency and improving greatly the uh, experience at the user end. So yeah, so uh, thanks to Mavari streaming service, a lot of the heavy rendering computation was sort of offloaded off from the device. That allowed a technology like us to still use a lot more resource on the device as well to track the user's uh, position more uh, frequently and more seamlessly without having to burden it with additional rendering uh, resources as well. And thanks to Mobile EdgeX, we were able to deploy our services across different countries, across different network providers, without us having to do a lot of work. So yeah. That's fantastic. Um, so perhaps, Vasanth, you can just talk a little bit more about maybe what you learned from this project, or sure. you know, kind of some of the you know, problems you might have encountered or not encountered, or how easy it was. Yeah. I think uh, both uh, Harini and Luis uh, kind of briefly touched on it, right? Uh, one, one of the parts of, of a project like this is when, when you're deploying your applications uh, in multi-regions and, and have to manage all of that, right? So mobile eject sits there. But then more specifically, having the context of where your application is and where those devices are relative to your edge computing infrastructure. Um, exactly as Luis mentioned, uh, making sure that the meta human that is deployed in Germany is is the one that's actually speaking German as opposed to the one that's deployed in KDI uh, that might be speaking Japanese. And, and having one seamless platform to, to, to handle that, as well as SDKs that are integrated at your devices. So we, at Mobile Ajax, we provide SDKs for your devices to know exactly what is that closest cell tower that, that you want to have access to, and what is the latency and requirements associated with that. We, we briefly touched on network slicing, and that's a, one of those key areas around network functions that we, we're also looking uh, at working with operators on how we can better expose that. And all of that has to, has to be exactly packaged somewhere and then deployed seamlessly across all of these different edge sites. So that, that requires managing the, the uh, compute resources at all of these different uh, networks and also being uh, flexible to support the different infrastructure that's there, whether that be uh, NVIDIA GPUs, whether that be VMware, whether that be OpenStack. Uh, we we want to abstract all of that for, for developers and then just make it as simple as possible for them to, to ultimately uh, get that, that context, know where, what, how their devices should be connecting to the edge, and, and get that, that best performance and just have a seamless experience. And, and that, that's really where we fit in, in into the stack. And I'll add that it's, it's going to be critical that app developers and device developers uh, working with us very, very closely so that we can optimize for best performance, best battery usage, and uh, where we put what on the edge and, and things like that. Because at this early stage of development, uh, we need to work very, very closely um, uh, to, to make it happen. Yeah, I totally agree with that, Yasmin. Yeah. And Luis, what else did you learn about doing this project? 
Well, uh, basically, yeah, I mean, we really pushed the, the limit in terms of getting yeah, two or three streams and synchronizing them uh, across the edge, because that's, that's very critical. It's very different to synchronize a multiplayer experience locally rather than rendering it on the edge and then back to the, the smartphone so that the actual users see the same thing. Uh, we were able to pull it forward uh, thanks to Mobile EJX and, and yeah, the low latency that, that we got from, from the Mac server. The latency I can tell is was about 16 milliseconds, and we were able to sustain uh, uh, 30 frames per second uh, frame rate uh, uh, on on the application, but also on on the server side. So that was uh, quite uh, quite a, quite a good learning. Uh, the second one is that uh, I just want to emphasize that. For example, right, right now, Ori also mentioned a lot about the, the metaverse, and every talk, everyone is talk, talking about, like, okay, so how are we going to build the, the metaverse? How, isn't that a drinking game? <laughs> <laughs> it is now a drinking game. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, nobody really takes a look at the infrastructure part. And the infrastructure, without the infrastructure, we cannot scale this. And this is a, actually the core of this, uh, this panel. Um, Carriers, uh, mobile ejects, Starfeam, Amawari, all we need to work together. Come together, yeah. yeah. Um, so I wonder, if, can we get Greg back on the screen? Yes, no. Oh. <laughs> oh, okay. Right. We oh, I just him. forgot one thing. Uh, yeah, the other learning is that we were able to do split rendering, which means we were able also to manage which resources were uh, rendered on the edge and some parts were rendered locally in the application that you That's saw. That's actually a really good point. We're working with chipset vendors and OEMs on the same uh, question. That is, that's important. Fantastic. So. I guess my next question um, for you guys is, you know, so we've seen a lot of POCs, right? Mm -hmm. How do we actually get to, in your opinion, how do we get to scale with this? So obviously T-Mobile has an amazing 5G network, right? Yeah. How are we gonna get to scale and not a POC, but something that we're all using every day? What are your opinions on that? Should I go first? Yeah, yeah. Um, absolutely. What you saw with MLB, that was at T-Mobile Park in Seattle. My team here, hello. They are the ones who pulled it off, actually. Um, and uh, we could take that to other mobile parks, and uh, it would be uh, a great experience. We could take that uh, similar concept to enterprises. Uh, we are working with our enterprise uh, partners and customers to define use cases. Uh, as an, another example, we're working with um, an important airline um, to do uh, edge computing and bring in uh, better operations on the ground for them. Uh, we're working with uh, the top 12 out of 50 um, enterprise um, folks to, to bring in. They, we have customers that have uh, big, big questions and big solutions, and we're working to customize, and, uh, and we can then scale from there. Yeah, I think that T-Mobile is, you know, you have such great branding for consumer, but people do forget about T-Mobile for business. Yeah. And obviously you have, you know, the number one customers in the world, really. Um, so, you know, I think it's uh, I think it's good to mention that yes. you are also looking at enterprise use cases. We are, we are. As well as uh, we announced a, a, part, a trial in our Vegas market with a driverless car, Halo. And it, uh, that, that requires high bandwidth, low latency applications and mobility. So the breadth of coverage that T-Mobile brings um, provides all sorts of opportunities. Um, our 5G network uh, is, is bigger than AT&T and Verizon's combined. <laughs> I'll put in that out there. And it, it, it provides solutions, right? Uh, opportunities for application development, type of places where we want to be on the road, in building, in a home, uh, wherever the innovation is, uh, let's work together to bring that to life. Um, Vasath, what do you think about how do we get from you know a POC to scalability here? Yeah, and I, I think the the enterprise is when when we're we're looking at the ecosystem, uh, we're we're deployed with uh, several different operators around the world um, in kind of smaller deployments, and I think the enterprise is really necessary to, to drive that demand to really scale out these, these sites that we have. So uh, 
I mean, we, we talked briefly in the, in the, the KDDI uh, uh, demo that we did. Uh, we, we're running these on NVIDIA T4s um, that can support a few, a few people, right? Um, but that, that's not nearly enough resources to actually scale this out to an actual city where you want thousands of tens of thousands of people actually connecting to these 5G networks and, and leveraging that edge computing. And how do you, how do you actually grow out that infrastructure? You, you need demand from real requirements from enterprises to actually start using these solutions that we, we're, we're seeing. We're, we're seeing lots of developers get excited about the edge computing space, and, and Mawari and Sturfy here, I think, are, are really great examples of that. But then really attaching that to the, the requirements and needs of enterprises to, to really drive revenue, and then ultimately then that means that the infrastructure is necessary to, to be scaled up um, to the global sites that we, would, we ultimately want to see. So, Luis and Harini, I, your example of what you've done with KDDI is not really a POC, correct? Uh, so. Yeah, <laughs> ours is really not a POC. It is at a commercial deployment level right now. They do have apps. We are a cloud-based services. However, I do want to add to uh, uh, Vasan's point that um, uh, even for a small startup like us, if infrastructure such as the 5G mobile Ajax or whatever Mavari is offering, if all of these come together, we also have to rethink our solution. We have to rethink our package to make it appeal or uh, appear uh, at a much better experience to even a larger crowd. I mean, we are currently deployed all across Japan. Uh, uh, we do have uh, our customers, which is KDDI, have commercial apps. Same thing, we work with LG closely. They have public apps too. But imagine the possibilities that can come with 5G. Uh, we as vision engineers, we are always greedy for computational resource. We are a greedy breed. <laughs> That's just us. But always only in the interest of the final user experience. So we can also rethink our solutions. We can package more into this if such resources are scaled at a global level. And if these resources are available to us, we can definitely work um, greatly as a team and make this you know, a truly a great world. So, Luis, I, I know that you have opinions about this. Sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, uh, first of all, yes, we also have commercially deployed uh, with, with KDDI uh, at uh, art galleries and, and museums. And it's fully operational. But as Karini said, there's a little bit of bottleneck and having the resources available. But in, in general, I think it's a collective effort, but from both sides, because there are some opinions that, OK, we need to remove the barrier of entry for uh, end users, like by reducing the size of the, of the headsets, and et cetera, et cetera. But also, if we don't reduce the barrier of entry for developers to jump into uh, edge computing, then there are no use cases. And then the users cannot actually uh, see the benefit or or we cannot generate, generate the right demand so that we can build the, the, the infrastructure. So in, in, I would summarize it in, in three things. Uh, is the interoperability uh, between carriers, which MobileJX is really uh, helping us uh, with this, creating standards, because right now everything is custom made. Uh, like you really don't have an idea how hard it is really to pull together something like what, what we did because there are no standards. And everything, yeah, it's just, you have an idea, we want to make it happen, and we have to build it from, from scratch. So that's also very important. And, and lastly, yes, is uh, working with the user experience, uh, trying to, for example, what we did with KDDI with the smart glasses is that the user interface is just walking. So the user just need to walk, not need to operate any, any controller or hand tracking, because this is still um, very hard for the general user to, to, to get. But if they see just a message, walk there, look there, and then the magic start happening and users are like, wow, and they get it. So we, we did a couple POCs uh, at the uh, museums. And yes, we had an, an amazing response for, from even people that they didn't even know what AR is. Actually, standardization is a good point that uh, Luis brings up. And we've been talking about that on, on our team in terms of bringing elements into either 3GPP, IEEE, or other standard fora so that we could 
um, build scale off of that. That's, that's a great point that you brought up. And also I do know, so with Mawari as well, how it does help with the actual device as well. I think that's important to mention. Mm -hmm. Sure. I, I mean, I have some slides, but I don't. <laughs> oh, <laughs> do we have the slides? <laughs> So I can present a little bit of uh, our vision, but uh, I'll do it super quick. Just... You can do it verbally. Well, uh, yeah, okay, so we, we have a 3D uh, compression algorithm uh, in which we re render on, on the edge, and uh, it deconstructs the geometry and reconstructs it and on the device side, but with, with that, it's a very lightweight format on the device side that uh, actually saves battery and, and uh, bandwidth consumption. You know, which is very important, obviously, if you've got a device and you've got, you know, it runs out of battery or it gets really hot on your face because it can't render Unreal Engine or something like that. This is a very useful compression technology. And I think we, we also touched on it briefly before, right? But having a cellular connection tied into the device is also a key part of that complete package. Oftentimes, I mean, if you look at the Quest today, for example, right? It, we, we see deployments where you're, you're on wireless up until the, the, the 5G router and then, and then you ultimately get on the edge. But that's really not the ideal case scenario to really take advantage of 5G and edge computing. Um, really, you want that, that cell connection ideally on the device and if not, then maybe going to a 5G router. Um, but that, that's really what I think we want from the device end to, to really take advantage yeah. of, of all the advantages that you want. Yeah. Let, let's go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so, so basically, as I also just want to raise, like, uh, to, today we have a 3.3 trillion gigabytes transferred uh, every year. And when we talk about uh, AR, I'm not sure if everyone wonders, okay, so if this is the 2D internet, next slide, is to, to achieve this in 2030, is what's the amount of data, what kind of data centers, and what is, how are we going to support this, this infrastructure for, for the future? This is something to, to bring up. Uh, and more, more than anything, also the, the devices, as, as we say, need to be super lightweight for the user to, to be able to ad, uh, adopt it. And the content needs to be uh, instant. And that means streaming, because it, just like today, you go to Netflix, press play, and you are immediately served. Uh, with XR, it needs to be the same way. If you have to download, 20 gigabytes of an application just to have an experience. Most people won't, won't have the patience for, for that. So next slide. Uh, yeah, so, so the, the main point, and, and working with um, companies like MobileJX, um, main point is that, yeah, today's uh, cloud infrastructure is not really uh, ready for, for the scalability, and we need to work together to build these blocks and go to the next step. Uh, go to the next slide. Uh, so yeah, for this reason, we built our solution. Go to the next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, yeah, so what you ask, uh, Luisa. So our compression algorithm uh, reduces um, the, um, the consumption on the device uh, up to 60 times. Uh, this is benchmarked towards an uh, NVIDIA RTX uh, 380. So just imagine that you have a big GPU inside your smartphone and you can render the same quality of content. And the second one is that we reduce the bandwidth uh, up to 100 times compared to, to uncompressed uh, volumetric video. So this allows actually for scalability and more devices uh, to, to enjoy uh, XR content. Yeah, that's it. Fantastic. Okay, last Thank question, you. everyone. So, um, I would like to hear from each of you, you know, what is your ultimate use case? It could be enterprise or consumer. So, let's hear it. I know, Vasant, you've probably thought about this uh, yeah, day I'm, in, day out. <laughs> I mean, I, on the side, I, I love remote rendering. Um, and so, I, I think from a, from a B2C scenario, I just want us, us to be able to have, in my ideal vision, I, I want us to have WebXR, uh, remote rendering, uh, all kind of tied together so that when we're enjoying XR content, um, it's not tied to specific devices. It's, it's streamed, it's very low latency, it's high quality, um, and it gives developers that flexibility. So I, I really, at the, the end of the day, I see a lot of these different technologies merging together 
uh, to create really powerful experiences and kind of an e open ecosystem. That's, that, that's really what I would hope to, to have happen. Yasmin? Well, we are working on the um, enterprise um, applications today. Um, we're also, at T-Mobile, a big consumer play. So uh, we're, we're looking at both sets of applications. We're very successful in the consumer space as well. So. And obviously you have spaces with Qualcomm. We have spaces with Qualcomm. We're the preferred partner or the initial partner. And uh, we look forward to working with them on that. Luis? Definitely uh, entertainment is, uh, or the consumer side and education. Also, I see a huge potential in education, especially because kids today, um, when they try smart glasses, they just immediately get it. They are digital native. So that's the, the next generation is where we should target uh, these services. And Harini? Um, social interactions would be the one for me. We can already see there's a lot of, uh, uh, with games like Roblox, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, time spent in the digital space. So uh, my ultimate goal would be people also come to the real space and the boundary between the digital world and the real world sort of vanishes away. People can have the same seamless interaction in both worlds. Both worlds are exactly identical. That's wonderful. Okay, so we have some time for some questions. Sure. Um, All right, I'm not doing the microphone's mics. Yeah. coming your way. So I think this is an appropriate question. For if uh, school children are viewing out in in the yard or in, in a on a playground, could do they see it all synchronously, or is it are they all seeing it from their own perspective? Uh, that's the point of the POC. We did three users uh, seeing the same thing synchronously. In, in the video there, they were all seeing the same thing at the same time. Yes, correct, and, but from a different uh, viewpoint. Because and, and, and it was Sturfy's positioning technology locked it down. Correct. And, and uh, our correct. streaming platform that where we orchestrated the MEX servers to be in synchrony. So our little endangered species preserve, they could all and did you use Unreal glasses for your demo in Japan? Yes. Uh, well, not for this one, but we do work with uh, Unreal glasses. But we glasses. have separately, we have worked with the same uh, KDDI with the glasses using our positioning technology, and they have worked with the streaming, so. Is, is there a preferred glasses vendor at this point that... that um, <laughs> no comment on that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? Someone at the back. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It was uh, really great to hear about the 5G. I have a question about um, the streaming, not just about the rendering, but also when it comes to, for example, streaming information from the mobile device, like the camera images out, processing them online, and sending the process data back. Is there like really low latency for this two-way streaming or? Yeah, the the, like I said, the round trip latency was 16 milliseconds. So, uh, one six, uh, 16 milliseconds. Okay, thanks. So uh, that is the interesting part. So we consume the images from the uh, device to the edge for the localization purposes. And Mavari was rendering the output and streaming it back to the devices. I'll also add in, uh, so we, we work at MobileHX, we work with a, lot, with a lot of AI use cases that are, are streaming from 50, 100 um, IP cameras uh, in, into the edge. And so while latency is also is, is, key, is key, which is in the case here, um, we also see a lot of uh, use cases that take advantage of that high bandwidth that you get over the, the 5G spectrum um, and, and can do that processing at the, the edge, which you would incur higher costs if you're if you're ultimately going to the public cloud. So that that's kind of a real we we, we summarize that as data bandwidth thinning, um, where you you run all of these IP cameras to the edge, you run the machine learning algorithms there off of the the GPUs, um, and then you can process that, send a very small footprint of data wherever you want, uh, for, based on that inferencing. Thank you. So I think that's it. I want to thank the panelists, yeah, especially the fantastic panelists. women. Um, <laughs> so thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.